Thank you. I'm glad you said there are some wonderful journalists. <laughs> that's, that's very I didn't put you in that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I didn't ask to be put in that. I didn't ask to be put in that. But what you are saying underlines or reinforces what I at least meant to say in the beginning, that religion should be a private affair. It should be a personal affair. It should not be part of the public uh, sphere. The moment religion becomes part of the public sphere, it becomes identity politics, as we have seen happening in this country. It becomes mobilizing people on the basis of religion. It becomes factionalism. It becomes majoritarianism and minoritarianism. No question about it becomes that. extremism of the Hindutva variety and extremism of the Islamic fundamentalist variety and all other kinds of e e extremisms. We have not had it so acutely bad until the recent post-liberalization phase. And that has coincided with the rise of what I call the New Age gurus and this whole religiosity in the public sphere. That can't be a sure coincidence. I would say, knowing uh, at least a few people and the nature of their work, if the many, many gurus who are in the country were not there, there would be blood on the street. Or because they are there, there is blood no, on no, the street. No, no, Because if they were not there, there would be blood on the street. There has been blood on the street. There has… I am not saying more. there hasn't been. You need to understand this. For a thousand years, we've been an occupied nation in many different forms. And there has been violence on the basis of religion, there has been force. So these things are happening, unfortunate things, but they're happening. But in reality, they are… When, in your opinion, did that occupa no, occupation no, no. begin? No, no. It's in an important question. In when did you think we became an occupied occupation? nation? Huh? When did you think, at what point in history did we become an occupied nation? In your scheme of history? <laughs> I know what you're driving at. Uh, <laughs> we become occupied when something is taken by force. Uh, a natural… If you… you know, a natural meeting and mingling of cultures and things changing is different. But when things happen by force, that's called an occupation in definition. But I am telling you, not just in India, everywhere in the world, religious violence is much lower today than ever before. If you look back three centuries ago, what was happening and what's happening today, it is way little. It is just because of twenty-four-seven media channels. If ten people die in one corner of the country, the blood spills into our sitting rooms and bedrooms and everywhere. But thousand years ago, if thousand people died in another part of the country, we would sit here watching peacefully the sunset, not being bothered about what's happening there because we wouldn't know anyway. We would never know probably, maybe we would know after a year. So the thing is, because of communication, it looks like a lot is happening, but let's acknowledge this. For the first time, I am telling you, twenty-first century, for the first time, we as human beings are a lot more peaceful than any other century in the last twenty, twenty-five centuries. I think we were until a decade or two back. <laughs> you see, you can't compare what we are doing now with three hundred years and one thousand years. Okay. There has been progress, there's been modernism, there has been science. In the science. last decade, People, you think there's much more violence? hopefully evolve, they don't regress. But now we are, it looks like we are regressing. How in can the, you compare? In the last with? decade, let's take last decade. Yeah. Since 1950, till two th to 2000, how many of these communal and religious clashes have happened? And how many have happened since then, if you look at it, it is way less. All the numbers and statistics will tell you this. Well, 2002 wasn't exactly a peaceful time uh, it is particularly not. I, in see, Gujarat. See, nobody is yeah. trying to give credibility to those events. These are horrible events. But you must understand this. We are addressing these issues only when it spills on the street. We must see this, the moment you hold something, when the moment you hold something that only you can be right, I am wrong, it's only a question of time before we clash, okay? My way is the only way if you hold this belief. When it is going to spill on the street, when blood is going to spill is only a question of time. So we need to bring that down. You can do what the hell you want, I will do what the hell I want. I don't have to call you names, which I don't. You should not call me names. I certainly won't <laughs> <laughs> Because you may think you're doing very useful. I also know that I am doing something very, very useful. 
and there are millions of people who will acknowledge that it is super useful for them. If you think it's trash, it's unfortunate because to receive and to digest certain dimensions of life, you need a certain level of receptivity. You must understand this, going at everything intellectually is a very poor way of going at life because intellect is a knife. Tell me, would you choose to have a sharp intellect or a blunt one? What is your choice? Sorry? A sharp if intellect, you, sharp, certainly, yeah. You would like a sharp one. So it's like a knife. Whatever you give the intellect, it will make a dissection of it and look at it. So if I really want to know you, should I dissect you? Mentally, yes, perhaps. I mean, if, it, if that's the way you will know me. I think it varies. I don't think everybody knows everyone else the same way. There's I'm no telling you, there is another way of knowing life. By sheer embrace, you can know life. Certainly. You don't have to dissect it. Certainly, yeah. So if you go at everything as a dissection, you, if I dissect you, I will know you, you have two kidneys and liver and whatever else and whatever else. But I will not know you. To know you, it needs inclusion. So if you go intellectually, knowingly or unknowingly, you keep on dissecting everything. This is like you want to stitch something, but you, you, all you'll have is tatters. This is what the so-called intellectuals are doing. Getting the world into tatters and they're thinking they're doing something fantastic. No, I think having a zombie-like peace, having a zombie-like fatalism… <laughs> do, I, do I look zombie-like? No, no, no. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. I'm saying having a zombie-like fatalism, which has been the curse of India for a long time. We are no. fatalistic people, the qu that you should not no, question let me, certain let things. Let me correct that. Can I correct that? Huh. This is the only land… Please listen to me again. This is the only land on the planet where we have been told for thousands of years that your life is your karma, which means your life is your making. That yes. means nobody up there managing you. Absolutely. You say that in your book, you say man should be the master of his destiny, not in as many words, that when… if you… if you take hold of your destiny, destiny take, takes charge. You say that, I think. But the point is, in what you subsequently roll out, it doesn't give me charge of my life. <laughs> it, it's too prescriptive, it is too fatalistic, it leaves me no choice but to belong to a particular creed and a particular belief system. That's the problem. Belief and spirituality cannot exist together because the fundamental of belief is you assume things that you do not know. The fundamental of seeking is you have admitted that you do not know. I do not know is a tremendous possibility. If you deny this, is it because of your exaggerated belief or your intellect? Both ways, people deny this. They deny risen up somewhere. But these are all things on this planet, expression of joy, love and peace happened only from a human being and some other creatures also. Dogs are loving, many other creatures are loving, but it never rained from up there, ever. This is a fact, all right? Using this fact, this sense of being peaceful and happy is not the end goal. Joy is a fundamental ambience that you need. If you want everything within you to unfold, particularly if human genius has to unfold, it's very, very important that you are in a pleasant state of experience. There is substantial medical and scientific evidence today which clearly shows you that only in pleasant states of experience, human intellect and genius will unfold. In unpleasant states of experience, sometimes in strife you do incredible things, but it won't last, it's just a momentary thing because of danger, because of being suppressed, because of being cornered, something may come out, but that's only a momentary flash. But if you want a continuous outflow from you, you must be in a pleasant state of experience. So happiness, is not the goal to seek in heaven. Happiness is the fundamental ambience that is needed for you. If you want to enjoy your dinner tonight, you must be at least happy, if not ecstatic. If you want to enjoy a walk on the beach, you must at least be happy. If you want to enjoy the few people that you live with, you must at least be happy. So let's understand happiness and joy and peacefulness as most fundamental requirements, basic ambience in our life. This is not the final goal.